is dit. Why is this not the way I want? Yes. Okay. Docs chat. Welcome in the chat room. <clears throat> Shit. Do, 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 do. Uh Okay. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. Uh, that is much more like it. Okay, <laughs> this is uh, almost what I want. Okay, welcome everyone. Up oh, now, stupid docking system in OBS Studio. Never mind. No, don't dock. Don't you dare. And just about, I'm just about ready. All right, let me adjust the screens outside a little bit. All right, I am almost settled. Just one more thing. All right. <coughs> okay, is anybody out there watching me? I have no idea. Well, no, stop that stupid docking system, uh, OBS Studio. Um, just uh, tell me in the chat and let me quickly remove this tea bag. I'm probably looking at the wrong things, but uh, I have no idea how many people are in, in the watching, but I'm just going to start anyway. I'm a bit late, but uh, this is my presentation about, this is my talk about recent developments in the solar system. And uh, this is a presentation I normally do for the uh, uh, workgroup Moon and Planets, uh, uh, the Werkgroep Maneplaneten of the Royal Netherlands Society Association for uh, Weather, for Meteorology and Astronomy. And I am the public relation person for our little workgroup Moon and Planets uh, thing. Um, I usually block in Dutch about uh, this topic uh, and also on Facebook but if you want to see me uh, see any English communication you're probably better off at my Twitter account at Marcel Jan KR 
as you can see over here, uh, lower left. And uh, usually I do this presentation uh, every half year, every time we have a gathering uh, with our work group or a virtual gathering uh, since uh, last year. And um, we uh, and, and I basically discuss everything that has happened uh, in space flight and astronomy uh, in our solar system that we learned in the last uh, last half year. So uh, that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to do it in English and I hope you like it. And uh, what I usually do is I start from the uh, sun, uh, but uh, the sun is a bit of a different topic. And uh, I uh, just start from uh, Mercury uh, uh, to all the way uh, outside of the solar system and maybe even some interstellar stuff happening uh, that uh, came to pass our solar system. And um, so I start with Mercury and uh, Mercury, uh, uh, we don't have any missions around Mercury. Um, but we still, like I sometimes say, luckily we still have the data. Um, and yes, and let me remove my webcam a little bit so that you, okay, that you can actually read what I'm had in the text here. Uh, yeah, so Mercury, Mercury, uh, uh, we didn't don't have a, uh, an orbiter or anything at this moment uh, European uh, the Euro European Bepi Colombo mission is still underway but it takes a couple of years to get to Mercury but we also have data from NASA's messenger mission that uh, orbited uh, uh, Mercury a couple of years and this um, mission had uh, uh, a uh, an instrument uh, detecting uh, charged particles, a plasma spectrometer it was called. And uh, it was actually to check the uh, interaction between the solar winds and uh, Mercury. Uh, but uh, uh, they found in the data from um, uh, December 2013, uh, something strange, suddenly in that data there were sodium and silicium ions. So it, ions are charged particles. And uh, what they deduced is that this was actually the result of an impact of an, a meteorite on Mercury. And they even managed to find out that this was how big this object was, something like a meter big. And um, uh, they, uh, yeah, this, they, they detected this with messenger from an altitude, altitude something like 5200 kilometers or 3300 miles. So that's pretty cool. Um, that's all I have for Mercury, but Venus, Venus will be a uh, lot be be lot more to talk about. So Venus, yeah, that's actually interesting because of course uh, last uh, year we in the, uh, September we had this discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, and uh, this uh, phosphine. Uh, has only a couple possible uh, originations or origins. Um, the vulcanism is one, and maybe, just maybe, it might be microbes, actual life. And um, but before that, we of course needed to be sure that we actually did find phosphine. And uh, there actually have been a discussion. So September was the uh, the reveal, big reveal. There's phosphine in the atmosphere from of Venus. And then the other papers came, well, actually, it's uh, statistically not significant, so maybe it's not there. Then the original team came back and they said, well, maybe uh, we, uh, the concentration we found was, is maybe a little bit lower, but still we think that phosphine is in the atmosphere. And uh, a couple of months ago, they did a follow-up uh, measurements uh, with uh, follow-up observations with, uh, I think, the ALMA telescope in Chile and they still found phosphine. So phosphine seems to be still here to stay. And of course, we want to know more about this. Uh, uh, what, what, uh, is it actually there? What is uh, causing it? And um, you might be uh, excused to be thinking, well, let's start, uh, launch a new mission. But um, you can also consider having a look at the data from old missions because actually there were quite a couple of missions that went through the atmosphere of Venus and did measurements. 
Now, for one part, there were a lot of Venus, uh, so Soviet uh, Union uh, missions, Veneras, that went through the atmosphere, landed even, survived for uh, more, for maybe even up to two, two hours. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, I'm not so sure we know where the data, uh, the de detailed data is about that. Uh, but NASA also had a mission uh, with uh, atmospheric probes uh, that was uh, Pioneer Venus in 1978. So that is actually uh, also quite a long time ago. And uh, they did have some data online, uh, but a lot of it was not digitized. So they uh, there was a couple of, uh, couple of uh, scientists that uh, went to uh, the, the library, I think it was even the Library of Congress, to see um, to this, see this data and this data is stored on microfiche so they had to digitize it and they actually did that now and they say well we definitely find uh, in the in the uh, the altitude where we found the uh, phosphine where the, the phosphine was detected by ALMA and the uh, Maxwell telescope we uh, also uh, find phosph a phosphorus based molecule and phosphine does seem to be the best match for the signal we found. Uh, not only that, they said they uh, say there is a um, that there is a, a, a imbalance in the uh, chemistry in, in the uh, atmosphere at that altitude, which could mean there is something eating some mo uh, some of the chemistry uh, at that at that layer in the atmosphere. Um, uh, they even say they found some molecules that could be the rest products of uh, microbes eating things, uh, which still not is not making exactly sure that they're microbes, but it's getting more and more and more intriguing. So how are we going to investigate that? Well, um, actually, there were no missions. Uh, uh, there were a couple of missions planned. India has a mission planned in 2024. Uh, and NASA actually had nothing. Uh, NASA hasn't selected any Venus missions uh, for decades. Uh, but it happened to be that yesterday they had to pick a new uh, mission for the Discovery program, the, the low budget uh, space probes to uh, the planets. And they picked two Venus missions, Da Vinci Plus and Veritas. And Da Vinci Plus will be a probe that will enter the atmosphere and land on, on the surface or it's not actually to survive very long on the surface but it will conduct a lot of measurements of the chemistry of the uh, at, uh, of the atmosphere of venus now they did not create it mis this mission to detect phosphine they actually later uh, the, 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 they work for years on such a design and the measurement of phosphine uh, was revealed last year, September. So they couldn't have completely overhauled their whole design. That's not how it worked. Actually, NASA was already had already down selected this mission uh, last year uh, uh, and Veritas as well. But uh, it could. Uh, the 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 the. I think they might be used. This might this probe might be used to find phosphine. Uh, it all uh, the very important question. Another very important question they're trying to answer is whether Venus had oceans in its uh, past, because it really really looks like that Venus uh, might have been an ocean planet maybe a billion years ago. So that seems like a long time ago, but actually, uh, if you look at so that's one fifth of its whole existence uh, was it maybe a hellish hell hole like it is now. Uh, but it might have been uh, much, a much better climate uh, uh, a while ago. And we don't know why or the, what, what happened. Uh, we just seem to find some, some proofs that there might have been something happening there. Um, the Veritas orbiter is a uh, orbiter with a radar instrument, a large radar instrument that will uh, uh, map the surface of uh, Venus in 3D so it will be have an altimeter map and everything. So that is another thing. Uh, so yeah, so both two Venus missions to study all this. Uh, that's going to be very interesting. And they will be launched somewhere between 2028 and 2030. Now on to Earth, but we are uh, pretty know pretty much seem to know that planet. Uh, so let's have a look at the Moon. What's happening there? Well, this is maybe. My talk here is getting a little bit more political uh, uh, than scientific because 
Uh, well, uh, NASA is uh, working on creating a, a manned space station around the moon. It's called the Lunar Gateway. Uh, but the political part about this is the way you launch these things, because NASA uh, has been working for quite a long time on a very big rocket, the space launch system. Uh, but because uh, this is um, something uh, backed by a lot of senators, they sometimes call it the senator launch system. Uh, and uh, this this space launch system uh, was uh, one of the, the purposes was to launch this station until uh, the beginning of this year when the uh, they actually said well uh, we're going to launch two modules uh, with uh, Falcon Heavy by SpaceX so we're maybe we're not going to use SLS and uh, also um, another thing they were supposed to launch by SLS was the uh, Europa Clipper mission to uh, investigate uh, the uh, ocean uh, moon of Jupiter called Europa. And they also said this has to be done on SLS and uh, now maybe not so much. Now suddenly uh, they said, uh, well, NASA said, actually we need these uh, SLS uh, rockets more for the human uh, space program. So uh, can we use another rocket? And they had the go ahead for that as well. So that's going to be a commercial rocket as well. And then uh, there was uh, uh, that uh, that thing that Donald Trump said you, uh, to NASA: you have to launch, you have to land uh, humans on the moon uh, in 2024. So NASA said, yes, but we don't have a moon lander. You know what? We're going to ask the commercial parties to do that. So uh, I think last year they selected uh, three parties. Uh, that was the national team that uh, has this uh, rocket, uh, that has this uh, lander. You see on the right national team is uh, Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman and Draper. And uh, uh, so that was their design. On the left you have Dynetics, uh, which is a company with uh, um, uh, what they called uh, the, 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 the building, the Dream Chaser shuttle, oh, um, Sierra Nevada. And, uh, and and then there's SpaceX. But SpaceX actually got the least money because, well, NASA was not exactly sure the way they managed, was ma were managing things. Uh, they found that there was a bit of a risk. So uh, National Team and Dynetics got the most of money. And now, a year later, uh, we're looking, uh, we were looking at who is actually going to win this deal. And NASA said only SpaceX won uh, because they were the cheapest. And we only had $3 billion to launch this human launch system and yeah spacex is by far the cheapest so they're the win they're they're they're, they're the winner uh, uh which uh is not the end of the story because national team and dynetics both uh protested and the way this goes in politics is when uh, the other comp uh, companies protest which is uh, not a big deal for the protesting companies um they um they can't lose basically uh, uh, only yeah well anyway uh spacex has to stop developing the lunar starship that they were planning but of course uh nobody told spacex to stop the starship itself so they kept uh launching these and even landed one successfully recently um also the uh american politics politicians are not amused because they are accustomed that when you launch a, a big uh, expensive thing that uh, you're gonna uh, build this part in utah and this part in alabama and this part part in missouri and this part in florida and this part in texas and spacex is not doing any of that so they just launched that from they, they, they built that in texas and maybe california and it's all going to florida and launch so uh, or maybe in Texas. Uh, so um, uh, then the politicians <laughs> said, you know what? Um, uh, yeah, uh, we uh, we want NASA to pick a second party. And so NASA got $3 billion for this thing. But now suddenly, suddenly uh, the politicians opened their wallet and said, here's $10 billion, pick a second party. And uh, um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. I saw already that uh, Bernie Sanders protested this thing saying this is basically a bailout for jeff bezos the owner of uh, blue origin and previous owner of amazon so a lot of politics uh let's not stay here for too long uh, uh but it's uh, kind of a uh, interesting uh, soap going on there so um a, a, a less happy uh, uh, uh event uh, we saw the the astronaut mike collins apollo 11 
astronaut Mike Collins uh, passed away in on a- April the 28th. And now I read things like that he was the forgotten astronaut. I can't imagine because he was the third astronaut on Apollo 11. He circled the moon. He made sure that his colleagues uh, uh, Aldrin and Al- Armstrong returned safely home on Earth with all those moon rocks they gathered. Um, so yeah, it seem, he seems pretty famous to me, but it's just maybe me. Uh, he also flew on Gemini 10 before, uh, docked twice with an uh, Agena target. And uh, uh, yeah, and he was uh, the director of the, uh, the um, National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. And I've been in that museum uh, long after he was director, by, by the way, there, or administrator. And that that museum is just amazing i made a video about this long ago uh, because it's just it's incredible what you see there among which of course the apollo 11 capsule where which uh, was command uh, piloted by uh, collins uh, but a lot of other stuff there as well okay then that's sls rocket so that sls rocket had to go through a test this year and in january they did a green run test and uh, it was supposed to run for the complete duration of a launch of this first stage of the SLS eight minutes but after one minute some kind of sensor gave off uh, a warning and decided to stop the run Uh, so in March they had to try again and they did a a test for the full duration uh, of eight uh, minutes uh, that uh, that it ran and uh, so that was successful. So now they can continue. Uh, so there, it's supposed to launch this year, at the end of this year. The first stage has arrived at for Artemis 1, the first mission on the, of this rocket, uh, unmanned with an Orion uh, spacecraft, space uh, capsule with a European propulsion module behind it. And this will, uh, is now, they're about building things uh, around this, uh, on this, uh, in the vehicle assembly building. So, uh, probably would be very cool to see the vehicle assembly building at this moment when, when they're building this. I've been in there once and it's uh, already a cool uh, thing to visit, but this would be very cool if, to see the complete rocket being built up there. Okay, on to the next planet, Mars. And there's a lot happening here. So let's first start with the bad news. Um, NASA's uh, Mars Inside Lander, it's uh, one of the few things that can't move on Mars uh, from by, that's landed by NASA the last recent years. Uh, this is uh, a, a mission to, to discover things about the inside of Mars. So they had a seismometer and this has been very successful. But it also had a heat probe and it was supposed to dig into the surface and go uh, three to five meters deep. Uh, But that didn't work. uh, The the, the, the surface of Mars uh, uh, was, yeah, didn't give enough friction for the heat probe to dig itself in. And they've been trying and trying and trying to get this uh, thing underground and uh, basically uh, didn't get it to work as uh, they managed to get it in uh, they, so they started uh, all kinds of other i try all the kinds of ideas like uh, put using the robot arm to push on its end to get it underground and they got it a little underground at least so they can do some measurements but not at all the measurements they hope to do but it sim- simply didn't work the they had uh we're digging this uh, using this thing to dig itself in and it came up again to everybody's surprise and lots of weird stuff happened um okay but luckily there's a lot of other news and uh, let me get myself out of the way of the oh oh back no 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 uh wrong screen uh yeah so uh but uh, luckily lots of other happy news was happening around mars uh, in this year there was the uh, there were three Mars missions that arrived in February. Uh, the first one was the uh, Emirates Mars mission uh, or uh, Hope, uh, by uh, launched by the uh, with a Japanese rocket for the uh, United Arab Emirates. This is a sort of a climate satellite that is this this um, investigating how Mars is losing its atmosphere because Mars. Uh, had more atmosphere, uh, uh, but it's uh, 
has been gradually gradually losing it. So this uh, satellite uh, f arrived in its orbit and it's doing uh, a lot of uh, measurements uh, since then. Uh, it has three three instruments: uh, the camera, a camera of which you see a picture on the left. It has an ultraviolet camera uh, that uh, is a picture on the right, and uh, there's another instrument uh, that uh, investigates uh, upper atmosphere of all that kind of stuff. So that's hopefully we're going to le learn a lot about uh, how that uh, loss of atmosphere happened. Then uh, China had a launched a very ambitious mission, Tianwen One, and this is a, a mission with an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. And uh, it arrived the day late after the Hope mission by the United uh, Am uh, Arab Emirates, and um, uh, the orbiter has a very sharp camera and you can see a picture on the left from uh, a high point in the orbit of Mars and a picture on the right is basically a picture uh, of where the rover and the lander were supposed to land and that was uh, but they kept the the lander and rover in orbit for a couple of months and we shall see how that uh, worked out for the rover later on but at least uh, it's uh, it's do doing its thing there. And then uh, in uh, uh, on February 18th, the Perseverance rover from NASA landed, and uh, this uh, rover looked very much like the rover, um, uh, the Curiosity rover that landed in 2012. It had the same kind of landing system with a jetpack, uh, uh, sky crane, and everything. Um, uh, but uh, with totally different instruments and uh, different goals, basically. Uh, but the chassis more like more or less looks the same, and uh, the landing was of course pretty amazing. And I think I should be able to show that now. Uh, <laughs> we are yeah. starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver, where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. So they had uh, more cameras than Curiosity, so you could see the parachutes deploy. The parachutes had uh, uh, a kind of pattern that uh, was sort of kind of code for uh, what uh, uh, ascendance that uh, read their mighty things, the motto of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And of course, these kind of pictures we've seen also from Curiosity, the heat shield uh, releasing. But there's uh, there were more, much more cameras, or even microphones uh, on board, although you're not hearing that right here because the sound is from Mission Control. And this, uh, this uh, landing system was able to land much more accurate than Curiosity was able. So they're using a visual, vision system that can see what is uh, it's going on there and and uh, was able is able to uh, go around uh, obstacles and all that stuff velocity solution 3.3 meters per second altitude 7.4 kilometers now has radar lock on the ground Current and here you see upper left uh, upper right you see the delta the, the dried out delta of uh, the area uh, in uh, the, that's where probably okay. water came in in the Jezero crater, the and they're gonna the try to find uh, signs of past life of there. That's what uh, Perseverance is going to do: uh, find uh, possible uh, proof for per ancient second, life on Mars. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. So, so now they say the, the landing vision has found a solution. So it found we out where it is and uh, is uh, uh, now uh, trying to steer the, the whole uh, landing system uh, as uh, to, to uh, a, a specific location. Six kilometers from the surface of Mars. So the now it's uh, hanging uh, on its, uh, so basically the now the sky, sky crane is slowing the, the whole rover down. And, and when we almost land, uh, slowly, so, slowly, slowly before we the landing, you see uh, the cameras looking up, up at the sky crane as well. Meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters. 
Here you can see it's really pinpointing the landing and then you can also see the effect of the rocket engines on the sky crane which is blowing the dust away and here you can see upper left and upper right the camera is looking up to the sky crane which is awesome and down to the rover so we didn't have these pictures uh, with curiosity uh, back then and you can see the wheels dangling a little bit and then it touches the ground and the sky crane is cut off and it moves away and then we have mission so that was uh, very exciting it's always very uh, scary will it work will it not work no we're not doing that again and then the mission could begin and that was uh, uh, uh perseverance has a lot of things uh, th that have a lot of interesting things uh, going on uh it has uh, uh, for example it has a helicopter in called ingenuity which already flew uh, a couple of times it flew for the first time on april 9th 19th that was the first power flight on another planet is for this it has these enormous rotors you can't see but the whole package is not even that uh, that it's flying it's not even the whole thing is not that big it's one and a half kilograms and these rotors have to be uh, huge and also turn very fast they have to turn five rotate five times uh, faster than a helicopter on earth because the atmosphere on mars is so very uh, well uh, um, it's a uh, 1% uh, of the uh, thickness of the atmosphere on Earth. So it's, 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 it's not a lot to hang on to, but they managed to do it. It flew uh, three meters uh, in altitude and then landed back on its legs. Didn't crash, didn't turn in a tree. And uh, then they flew it four more times. And then uh, NASA said, go ahead, you get more time to do more experiments with this. Uh, so the official uh, program is over but they uh, were allowed to do more flights and um, they uh, uh, did a sixth flight and that actually went a little bit wonky. The, the, there was a delay in the images getting uh, processed. The, it has cameras to see where it's flying and they managed to land, uh, it managed to land on its feet back again. So it's still working, still able to fly, but they have to find out what's happening there. But in the future, you might see more of these helicopters uh, aiding uh, uh, research on Mars uh, and getting a picture of the whole area where uh, maybe a rover or even a human uh, uh, mission is uh, going on to get an overview of what's happening there. Uh, also, uh, apart from the helicopter, uh, Perseverance has this, uh, uh, has a new set of uh, uh, cameras, zoom lenses with zoom lenses. So the rover looks very much like the uh, the Curiosity rover, uh, but uh, it has uh, a lot of upgraded systems. And the zoom lens, for example, the, the cameras uh, 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 are 4K uh, cameras, so it's really amazing. You can view these uh, uh, videos from these on uh, YouTube, and it uh, really looks nice. And it can zoom in, so it could, for example, show this helicopter that is uh, uh, here on the surface. Uh, not only that, it's also doing, uh, of, uh, of course, uh, all kinds of experiments. One of the experiments is to see if they could uh, produce oxygen from the atmosphere of Mars. So the atmosphere of Mars is uh, uh, mainly carbon dioxide and you can make oxygen from that. Now, chemically, that's not incredibly, uh, not incredibly uh, uh, amazing, maybe. Uh, chemically, that's not uh, maybe the hardest thing to do. But um, uh, if you're going to need this uh, uh, for a human uh, mission later uh, to Mars, it can be a very uh, in, uh, important to have, test, have to test this uh, before you're going to uh, let the people depend on this. So they had this uh, exper experiment, experiment called uh, MOXIE and they tested it on April 21st and it actually uh, produced five grams of oxygen. So that's also working. Uh, and there's lots more to tell about perseverance, but that won't fit in my story today. Um, then, uh, yeah, I'm always interested what uh, other space or, uh, organizations are doing. And Japan uh, came with the announcement that they're working on a Martian ice mapper. So what is this going to do? Well, this will map the 
water ice under the surface of, of Mars uh, with the aim of uh, aiming, uh, uh, helping human uh, uh, Mars missions in the future uh, to, to get to water and also to find liquid water uh, because this uh, this has uh, this satellite will have a radar uh, instrument that will definitely be able to see not only ice but also uh, water under the ice, uh, maybe liquid water somewhere if it still exists. And we had some proof that it might be there, uh, but this might definitely uh, bring the, the the second opinion basically. Um, so water ice water is going to be very important for future uh, human uh, missions to Mars uh, because. Uh, Water is not only uh, can not only be uh, used for drinking water, or you can uh, split it in hydrogen and oxygen, but it pro uh, will do pr probably be used for uh, fuel because you can, with a not too difficult reaction, you can uh, create methane out of it and oxygen, and these are fuel and oxidizer, and you can use this in a rocket. It's not that uh, strange that Elon Musk is working on uh, a. a, a land uh, uh, starship that that is, is working on methane because it can be used on methane on mars as well in the in the future so that's it's uh, forward thinking basically then a, a whole different kind of uh, mars news uh, zodiacal light um, zodiacal light is the faint glow you can see shortly before uh, sunrise in very dark locations on Earth. So that definitely rules uh, the Netherlands where I live out. We uh, are very light polluted. But if you go in a desert somewhere uh, before sunrise, you might see this white glow. And we knew it was there, uh, but we didn't, at first we didn't know what it was. And then with early space missions like Pioneer 10, we found out that it, this stuff is actually uh, created by, this effect is created by dust in the solar system. And the idea was that this may, was maybe uh, dust, uh, uh, a remainder of the formation of the solar system. But then there was a Jupiter mission, Juno, uh, and, and well, it was underway uh, uh, to Jupiter. It got hit by dust particles uh, on the solar, solar arrays. And they found that with uh, an instrument that was actually not a scientific instrument at all, it was called the uh, Advanced Compass uh, instrument or something. Uh, and this has had cameras and they saw these impacts and they found out that these impacts were happening a lot around the orbit of Mars. So it seems like that Mars has lo lost dust somehow. We don't know exactly how. Uh, and this has, uh, has been uh, uh, left behind in uh, an orbit around the sun uh, at, at the distance of Mars, more or less. And they even put this in uh, computer models and found out that this uh, could actually be true. So this is uh, kind of in very interesting for, uh, uh, um, yeah, but not the new, not things, not, not something you see in uh, as big news, uh, usually this kind of uh, 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 findings. Uh, like I said, so the Chinese, back to the Chinese, uh, uh, Tianwen mission, the, uh, so they still had that uh, lander and uh, rover for a while in orbit. Uh, and then there were signs pointing that there was going to be a landing uh, halfway May. And this actually happened on May the 15th, they landed. And uh, you might know that landing on Mars is not trivial. It's very hard because the atmosphere is so thin, you uh, have nothing, almost nothing to to uh, to have uh, to, to use uh, to to decelerate with a parachute, but it's thick enough that when you go through uh, through the atmosphere at orbital speeds, that your spacecraft needs going is going to need a heat shield. Uh, but they pulled it off and they landed uh, this rover on a landing platform, and the rover already has recently has driven off that landing platform, and they're ready to do research. So the rover is uh, expected to work for at least 90 Mars days. 90 Mars days is a little bit more than 24 hours on Earth. So it's something like almost uh, 25 hours. And uh, it has some co couple of inter interesting instruments. Not only will it be able to uh, take pictures and uh, see what uh, the surface is like and what it's made of, but it has a ground radar system that can look beneath uh, to see whether ice deposits uh, underneath the surface uh, and uh, 
That's something the Chinese are very good at because they use similar instruments on the moon two times. So on to asteroids. Um, the asteroid belt. Well, actually, in the asteroid belt, we've seen uh, two missions recently gain uh, samples from an asteroid. And now uh, the first sample is returned to Earth. That is the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission. It uh, gathered samples uh, two times around an asteroid called Ryugu. And uh, it's the, the capsule with the samples landed in uh, uh, December last year. And uh, these are the pictures of the samples they gathered. So they gathered five grams. Now that doesn't sound like very much, but actually it's much more than they uh, had uh, account, uh, counted on. Uh, they uh, had uh, thought to get to gather about uh, 100 milligrams. And that from this, even this little amount of uh, samples, they can do a lot in Earth, uh, a laboratory on Earth. Uh, to Just to give them a the perspective, uh, the previous Hayabusa mission uh, that landed a capsule in 2010 had only specks of dust of micron thickness. And from that, they managed to find out how, uh, where the asteroid came from, uh, how it was uh, formed, and uh, a lot of other things. So with this amount of sample, uh, they should be able to do much more. You can also see some Chinese writing with an arrow on the right side. Uh, there's something mechanical. Uh, metallic in there uh, that uh, seems to be a part of the probe that broke off during the sample uh, the, they gathered uh, sample gathering uh, because uh, it's, an, it's happening usually with a lot of violence because an, such an asteroid has so very little uh, gravity and uh, yeah so uh, 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 things are flying all around uh, but the, the most interesting news uh, recently I heard was that they also found that there are boulders on uh, the surface on, of Ryugu that seem to be part of the very original material of the solar system, the uh, planetesimal uh, material. So this is uh, these planetesimals are the objects that first were uh, formed after the, the sun uh, got uh, dust. Uh, so first, okay, the first uh, material that formed the, the objects were, that formed af out of the dust uh, that gathered around the sun when the sun formed. And uh, this has, is very light material, not very dense. Uh, it's uh, very porous. And they uh, think they might have some, uh, some, some stuff from that very primitive material in the sample. Uh, but they haven't looked in the samples, but uh, basically, statistically, it's likely that they have some part of that. And that would be really, really interesting because, yeah, it's a kind of a thing uh, I'm very interested uh, in the formation of the solar system. We're learning so much recently about this. Uh, so uh, to be continued, uh, another uh, sample sampling mission uh, was uh, done by NASA in October last year with the OSIRIS-REx mission. Now, like I said, uh, these sampling uh, actions are usually happen uh, with a lot of violence uh, on the surface. So what they did, they had uh, OSIRIS-REx with a robot arm uh, touch the surface and the robot arm have a, had a disc through which they uh, and they, they from the disc they pumped nitrogen gas through the surface to gather a lot of uh, uh, sand and and uh, uh, little bits of rock in there and that was very successful uh, but uh, uh, the after sampling they made sure to get the satellite out of there as quickly as possible because you when you see this video everything is flying around there and that this was quite kind of violent uh, uh, that uh, was uh, clear after after they took pictures after the sampling event and uh, they compared it with the pictures before the sampling event so what happened here was that there was a, a, a rock of uh, about uh, more than a meter uh, in, uh, uh, more than a meter uh, thick, and this has moved for a couple of meters, and this is not a small, uh, not a not a light rock. This rock, uh, they told it had the, the uh, mass of a ton, so something between a cow and a, and a car. They said in the uh, the press uh, uh, briefing. So, and that just was tossed around a little bit. So uh, that's what happened when you get samples from an object with very little uh, gravity. Uh, on to another object that uh, has very little gravity, comets. 
Uh, there's not a lot of Comet news uh, in my uh, talk this year, this uh, half year. Uh, last time we saw the Comet Neowise, we, which we were able to see uh, about a year ago, which was very nice. I've seen it as well. Uh, that was very cool. Uh, it was the, for the very first time since a long time that we could see a uh, naked eye visible uh, comet. Uh, but uh, another cool comet uh, from a while back was uh, the Comet 2i Borisov. Uh, Borisov uh, was a, uh, is a uh, Russian amateur uh, astronomer who discovered this comet. And comets are one of the few things in the cosmos, if you discover it, you can name it, uh, give it your name. So uh, 2i Borisov, it was the second interstellar object we found, we discovered. And uh, they, of course, after the discovery, uh, uh, pointed all kinds of large telescopes uh, to this uh, on this uh, 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 comet. And they found out uh, that this comet has been uh, very, ha ha probably hasn't, hasn't seen uh, a, a star from up close. It's very pristine. Uh, it's very fresh. And the uh, sun is probably the first star it came close to. And uh, that is uh, kind of interesting. The, the second comet we, uh, this, we uh, investigated that was this fresh was uh, the comet Hill Bob. Uh, that was uh, uh, very, very well visible in uh, 1997. I hope to see a comet like that uh, once again. On to Jupiter. All right, uh, so I have some weird news from Jupiter because uh, the last thing you expect in a talk about the solar system is something about dark matter because uh, that's a cosmological uh, uh, topic, right? But there are a couple of uh, scientists who are thinking of using Jupiter as a dark ma matter detector. So how do they think they can do that? Well, they say that uh, dark matter, uh, uh, which is uh, not interacted with a lot of stuff actually it's it's passing through uh things uh, uh it's uh it's hard to very hard to detect otherwise we already would have known what dark matter is and we're still figuring that out uh but they say uh, a, an object with a large mass uh, interacting with uh dark matter would uh, uh create uh, um, gamma ray uh, radiation and we could detect that with a, uh, with a gamma ray telescope. Now we do have a gamma ray telescope, it's called Fermi, it's a NASA telescope, it's already been in orbit for uh, quite a long time. They tried to uh, detect it but uh, unfortunately uh, the Fermi is not sensitive enough so they're kind of hoping, hoping on the next generation of uh, gamma ray uh, telescopes which are actually still in the drawing table so yeah okay. Maybe not that interesting, uh, uh, as interesting as I hoped when I read this. Uh, the re the, the, of course, there's an object with even more mass in our solar system. It's called the sun, uh, but that uh, is too hot for this research. So they, they kind of need Jupiter for this. So we'll see if they ever get the chance to, uh, to investigate this further. So on th to something that's much nearer to home, my home at least, because uh, uh, European, the European Space Agency uh, is working on a, a mission to Jupiter called JUICE. It will uh, one day orbit the largest moon in the solar system called Ganymede. And um, before it's getting uh, uh, launched into space, they have to test it that it will uh, survive uh, the extreme conditions in space. And for this, you can uh, send your satellite to uh, the uh, Aztec Center in Noordwijk, the Netherlands. So this mission on its way to Jupiter is first visiting uh, Noordwijk in the Netherlands, which is pretty cool, I think. And also interesting to see, I saw some videos uh, from uh, ESA. How do you get a satellite out of a container uh, with which it has been traveling uh, to Noordwijk? Well, I saw that people actually have to drag it out. It has these rails and it's on these wheels, so they have to... Uh, pull this thing out and push on the other side. So that's, uh, that's the first step of a satellite getting into the, uh, the uh, large space simulator in, uh, in Noordwijk. So that's pretty cool. Uh, what else? Well, JUICE is going to investigate uh, not only Ganymede, but will also pass, treat, pass by the ocean, world, ocean moon Europa, uh, also around Jupiter, three times. 
And uh, recent uh, investigations, uh, mainly with computer models, uh, is telling us that there might be uh, volcanic uh, activity on the sea floor of Europa. So we're, we're, we're already pretty sure that Europa has oceans underneath the ice. We're not exactly sure how thick the ice is. We'll hope to find that out with the Juice mission and with uh, Europa Clipper. But um, uh, if Europa uh, seen, uh, would have volcanic activity, that would be very interesting. The, possibilities for for possibilities of life that would be very uh, very good to have the thing is if you go to the very depths of our oceans uh, where do you find uh, life there a lot of uh, often happen around these volcanic vents in uh, on the bottom of the ocean so europa could have vents like these possible possibly so uh, yeah story continues as well um, then on to Saturn, and at Saturn we had a uh, wealth of data from the Cassini mission. Uh, but uh, yeah, the Cassini, Cassini mission uh, has ended uh, a while back, and we're still picking the picking the fruits of the of the, all the data that has been gathered. For example, we're now getting a good idea what Saturn looks like from the inside, and uh, it looks like. Saturn has be, uh, been uh, has it's at the center an icy rocky core. Around it, it has metallic hydrogen. Excuse me. Let me have a bit of tea. And um, uh, metallic hydrogen is because of the pressure on the depths of these gigantic uh, 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 giant uh, uh, gas yeah, gas giants. Uh, so that's uh, hydrogen that being under, put under a lot of pressure. And um, then around that is something called HIL, which I still have to check out what that actually is. And there are, outside there is uh, molecular hydrogen. So that's basically what we think that Saturn looks like. Uh, and that's all I can say about Saturn for this moment. Then, uh, ah, yeah, there's still the Dutch... Uh, uh, Part, uh, translation of Neptune. So Uranus and Neptune, what's happening around that? Well, usually not a lot because we don't have any missions and we had, hadn't had any missions for a long time. But you can still look at Uranus with a telescope and even better, uh, use an X-ray telescope like the Chandra uh, telescope, which has been uh, uh, launched by the Space Shuttle years ago. And uh, they found out actually uh, there is some uh, X-ray activity at Uranus. Uh, it seems to be coming from auroras uh, and also might be coming from the rings uh, because even uh, rings can emit some uh, uh, X-ray. Uh, Saturn's rings do that as well. And uh, yeah, so they're thinking of doing follow-up observations with another X-ray telescope. European, European Space Agency, ESA, also has uh, an X-ray telescope called XMM-Newton. So we'll see what, uh, what that uh, gives us. On further, and uh, yeah, uh, talking about asteroids, we uh, 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 talking about interstellar objects. We had this uh, interstellar asteroid in uh, 2017 called Oumuamua, and uh, we we it, we learned about it uh, actually when it on, was on the way out. So we didn't get a lot of good data about it. But we found out when we discovered uh, it's leaving the solar system, they found we found that it, uh, its uh, trajectory was a bit off. It was going a little bit faster to out of the solar system than we expected. And you can think of uh, all kinds of reasons that that is. And there are a lot of speculations has been done about this. And this went anything from maybe it's a a uh, frozen piece of hydrogen from somewhere or it's uh, very fluffy. And uh, there also have also been uh, scientists who said they're alien solar cells, um, which is maybe not the first thing you have to think about if, to find a solution why uh, the trajectory is a bit off. But yeah, some people do that. Um, actually, uh, recently, a couple of scientists came up with a maybe much better explanation. They said, well, suppose you take Pluto and um, not a Pluto around our solar system, but uh, similar a dwarf planet like Pluto uh, uh, around another solar system. And suppose it breaks off and a piece of it gets sent into the cosmos by some event 
Uh, there are kinds of reasons why a piece of a planet or a dwarf planet can end up on an interstellar trajectory. Uh, uh, and um, uh, then what they uh, found, uh, calculated what it would uh, what would happen to it. And one thing would would happen uh, would happen it would sort of uh, erode by uh, galactic cosmic rays, and it would become some kind of a pancake, which would explain the light curve they found. And uh, if it is something similar to a piece of Pluto, it might have it will have different kinds of ices like. Uh, water ice but also nitrogen ice and they say if you take that in account you could very much explain the whole trajectory and uh, no light sails needed to uh, to explain uh, why it went out a little faster that might just have been the nitrogen ice uh, in, uh, um, uh, uh, going uh, uh, sublimating that's the word I was looking for so yeah so there's that uh, talking about uh, uh, dwarf planets, yeah, sorry, uh, I think Pluto is a dwarf planet. Uh, let's not go into that. Uh, but uh, we have other objects. Uh, we're finding more and more of these uh, sm small objects that are not exactly, uh, that are very far away from the solar system. And the first we f object we found that is, pre that is pretty big is an object we found in 2018 and it's unfortunately called far far out because the previous far first objects we found was called far out so astronomers please when we find a new object that is rather rather big and even further let's not call it far 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 out it's, it's thing about creativity you can do better but uh yeah um so far, far out, uh, it turns out to be, it's pr uh, pretty big, big, big. Uh, it's uh, 400 kilometers in diameter, we think now, and we got the orbit pretty well pinned down. Interesting thing is on the farthest point, it's getting uh, as far as 132 times the uh, distance between Earth and the Sun. So uh, 132 astronomical units. And the closest point is actually getting I think slightly inside the orbit of Neptune. So, uh, yeah, so there's that. Okay, what I also uh, uh, like to do uh, in my presentation uh, is to look out for the next half year. What can we expect? Well, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but uh, let's start with uh, July 2021, uh, uh, so this year, July. Uh, we're expecting the launch of NASA's DART mission to an asteroid. And it will not just explore an asteroid, it will smash into an asteroid. Or better, it will smash into a moon of an asteroid. And uh, that uh, will later be investigated by a European mission to, to see what, what, uh, what the result of that was. Uh, but uh, when after DART smashes into that asteroid, uh, uh, Earthbound observatories will look uh, if it was able to deflect the the orbit of that moon a little bit so we know that when there's an asteroid coming to earth with our name on it uh, and which might cause damage we might know uh, better what to do uh, how we can uh, avoid being hit by it uh, maybe by smashing a thing into it so there's that and then there is uh, in october we have Two possible launches. Uh, uh, first of all, we have NASA's Lucy mission, and Lucy mission, the Lucy mission, is a mission also to asteroids because astronomers nowadays love asteroids because uh, they have so much. Uh, they're almost unaltered uh, by their gravity, and they tell us a lot about uh, the 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 uh, birth of the solar system. And uh, Lucy is going to uh, to. Uh, the Trojan asteroids in the, around the orbit of Jupiter to find very ancient material. It will uh, fly by seven of these asteroids. Uh, well, that will take a while, but of course, first you have to launch it to get uh, get it on its way. And uh, another thing, uh, so uh, Russia is planning a, a moon lander called Luna 25 because they kept counting from the Soviet days and the last one in 1976 was Luna 24 so this is their first lunar lander since that time uh, there's some European instruments on there as well and I really hope that uh, they succeed and uh, show uh, it will be it should, should be a la landing on the 
uh, on the uh, South Pole of the Moon, which is very much interest at this moment. And then in November, well, they say every time you uh, um, call its name, the, uh, the, the name of this uh, giant telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, it is getting delayed. But let's hope the delays, days of delays are getting uh, past us and it will actually launch in November 2021 because uh, this is a really awesome uh, uh, telescope uh, with a six meter uh, mirror which is folded uh, will be folded out into space and there will be a tennis court sized uh, uh, solar uh, uh, um, rather uh, shield basically so it's going to be an awesome thing uh, but it's also awesomely expensive by now because it's been uh, uh, getting more and more expensive by the time they <laughs> were developing developing it and by the time it will launch on an Ariana 5 rocket from uh, Kourou in French Guiana uh, its price tag is now something like 10 billion uh, dollars so a lot of a uh, lot is riding on this launch and let's hope it all works out exactly as everybody planned and we get a wonderful observatory in space that will tell us a lot about the origins of the solar uh, of the uh, of the universe and about the atmospheres of exoplanets and a lot of other stuff and uh yeah so that is i think all i had for this session and uh, yeah um uh, I see nothing in the chat, so I'm actually not sure I've been talking to anyone at this point. If everybody anybody has been following this uh, this uh, this session, I hope the, that you did and that you liked it. And if you have any questions, uh, yeah, uh, answer. I'll try to answer them if you ask them in the chat. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you uh, at uh, some other time uh, when I do new sessions later on. So there's that, and uh, yeah, um, and otherwise, I'll uh, just uh, see you later somewhere on the weekly space hangout crew uh, chat on the Slack or on the Discord of the uh, Skeptic Guide to the Universe or on Facebook or f t Twitter, anything. So um, it seems like we don't have any questions so in that case thank you for watching and uh, see you next time when i find my mouse let me stop with streaming